Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, if we haven't met before, if you're somehow uh, joining us online and you're new to us, uh, if we haven't met, I'm the Reverend Graham Anson. I'm the minister here at Coromel Uniting Church, and I welcome you uh, with us this morning. Um, this morning, once again, we'll be reminded that love is the starting point and the end point of God. The Alpha and Omega, the foundation and the structure. We will be reminded that all we need is to love. <laughs> got close, got close, got close. And I've been in congregations where we would have sung it. All you need is love. Today we're going to be reminded that, that all we need is to love. That all that matters is that we do love. And, and what we can hope from life is found in knowing how to love. Often the who is not really important. Who do we love? Well, the answer is quite clear that it's anybody and everybody. Love has no boundaries. But today we're going to lean into a, that, that it's our willingness not just to understand love, but to live it that makes all the difference. So let's gather this morning in love. Let's give ourselves over to love. And let's expect that the love of God will meet us here this morning as we gather. As we do each week, we acknowledge country. We acknowledge the traditional custodians on whose land we meet, the people of Dharawal, Dharawal Nation. We pay respects to elders past, present and future. We stand in solidarity for truth and justice and a change of heart within Australian attitudes. Lord, may your work be done in reconciliation and justice. I'm wondering if there's someone for whom lighting the candle this morning. Oh, quick, Judy's up. I just wanted to say I'm happy to be able to see, to get up here, and um, thank you to everyone that's been caring for me while well, I've not been able to see. Um, and for those that know, I had a good report last night from the doctor. Hmm. Um, we light this candle this morning as a reminder that through the darkness, as we seek the way of God, the light of Christ shines to show us that the way of the Lord is love. to you. 
that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another as I have loved you. But this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another. You may be seated. By this, others will know through our love. Let's come to God in prayer. God of love, we hand ourselves over to you this morning to let go of that which holds us back. to acknowledge where we fall short, to seek your guidance to where there is true love and true life. Lord, soften our hearts to embrace that all of your laws, all of your precepts, all of your commands, all of your, your requirements, all that you desire of us, leads us back to love. A love of you. A love of others. A love of self. And Lord, probably in that order. So Lord, as we come to worship this morning, may we be prepared to lose ourselves in your kind of love. Might we truly give over and not just know or speak of your love, but, Lord, lose ourselves in it so that, Lord, we might truly find who we are meant to be and what we are meant to do in love, in Christ, by your Spirit in you. Amen. I'm going to invite you, if you're able, to please stand. We're going to pass the peace. <clears throat> Blessed are those who walk in the way of the Lord and seek God with their whole hearts. They will know peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you. And the Lord be with you. Thank you. I invite you to pass the peace with those around you. All right, I think um, children are heading out to jam, if I've got that right, this morning. Yep. We've got a new teacher today. Yes, Rachel's on today. Well done, Rachel. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, there's something else I was going to say. But anyway, send the kids with a blessing and we're going to sing, Behold the Cross. Um, as I said before, today's about love and this song, whilst we, we normally sing this in Easter week, uh, but I, I love this song in the sense that it is a reminder of the, the love that Jesus shows in, in giving all 
when he goes to the cross. So that's what this song, why I've chosen this song this morning, Behold the Christ. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 1 to 9. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I'm commanding you so that your days may be long Hear therefore, <clears throat> O Israel, and observe them diligently, so that it may go well with you, and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you can rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The second reading is from Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. 
One of the scribes came near and heard the religious people disputing with Jesus and with one another. And seeing that Jesus was answering them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our Lord, the God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and beside him there is no other and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbour as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any questions. May this leading reading help feed our hunger and quench our thirsty souls. Thanks, Ken. If I've got it right, I think that might be Ken's first time on the reading roster. Thank you. So thank you very much, Ken, for bringing in the readings this morning. If we were uh, reading the book of Mark in a sense of um, chronological time in, in line with our own time right now, if, if what I'm trying to say here is this reading would land in Holy Week. This would land, um, we would actually be reading this reading in the lead up to Easter Sunday. This reading is from the last week of Jesus' life. So whilst in some ways it sounds like all roses and butterflies, we need to understand that, that it's these kind of readings, it's these kind of answers, it's these kind of situations that end up with Jesus on a cross. So whilst love sounds like a big celebration, as I lead this morning, there's a heaviness in my heart because love is not a lightweight understanding. It's not a lightweight part of our life. Sometimes love is worth celebrating and sometimes love is all about streamers and balloons and, you know, dancing. But this, is, this reading this week reminds us that love sits in the nitty-gritty, dirty, hands-on, tough parts of life as well. This reading happens after Jesus, we had the reading a couple of weeks ago where Jesus has told his disciples he is heading for Jerusalem and he knows there will be a showdown and he knows he's not coming out alive. This, week, this reading happens after the triumphal entry into Jerusalem where Jesus does the, the anti-power, anti-authoritarian display of coming into town on a donkey. This is after he has overturned the money handlers' tables in the temple. This is after he has told a parable that basically was saying that the religious authorities were ignoring the most important piece of the God puzzle, Jesus himself. This is after Jesus has reminded the crowds that they may have to pay taxes. They do have to pay taxes. But don't forget to give all of who you are to God first. And in the book of Mark, Jesus now finds himself in this deep, complex and sometimes perhaps heated discussions with representatives of the Jewish factions within the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. 
I want you to notice where today's reading is taking place. Where the, where the, where the conversations are taking place. They're happening in Jerusalem. They're happening in the city centre, the centre of Jewish life. They're happening within the temple walls. They're happening with seasoned, rusted on, hardcore religious leaders. They're happening with the authority, the protectors of the faith. It's not happening in some small country village out in the backwoods somewhere with some amateur priest. Some blow-in, all right? This is happening right in the centre. Jesus couldn't get more intentionally directed or pointed than that. He's come to stand his ground. He's come to hold the ground of the lost and the downtrodden in the face of those who are causing that oppression. He's on a collision course with both religious and political power. And he has come to give his life if need be, and he knows that's where it's headed. Standing up to authority to show the people of his time and all of us who have followed since what the heart of God really is. So again, I, I, I invite you to take note of who, this, who is in the middle of this conversation. Notice who Jesus is talking to. Notice who are asking the questions and therefore have a think about what their motives might be. It's clear that they're attempting to entrap him. He has come to their city, to their turf, and they have come to shut him down, to dishonour him in front of the crowds, to show the crowds that this blow-in does not know anything about God. This blow-in is on the opposite side of God. Why are they doing that? I presume because they feel threatened. Why do they feel threatened? Well, my understanding of the Gospels is that Jesus is broke, breaking open this whole sense of God. Jesus is breaking open the heart, mind, soul, purpose, understanding of what it means to please and to displease God. He shifts the focus of God's dissatisfaction away from the people and lands it directly on the religious authorities. And the crowds are on his side. That's why they feel threatened. That's why they have to shut him down. Because the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the priests, the scribes, their sense of things is that this is our job. God is our job. Our job is to protect who God is from all this misunderstanding. Our job is to make sure that people don't come and lead others astray from this understanding that pleasing God is all about religious ritual and sacrifice and, and, and pleasing God is... is you know, like it requires a whole, uh, as I say, this ritual upon ritual upon ritual. It requires you to find yourself to gain honour. 
And they're saying to Jesus, basically, you don't, come, you don't get to come here and try and break that understanding open. You don't get to come here and destroy that understanding. Because Jesus is seen as dishonouring them. Dishonouring their position, dishonouring their power, dishonouring their knowledge, their experience, their religious experience and maybe even their experiences of how they're understanding God. And he's not just doing it in a private setting, he's doing it in the temple, in front of crowds. Not just any crowds, but all the crowds who have come from all over the known world to come for Passover. You can understand why anger would have grown amongst those who held power. So in the midst of all these discussions and all these kind of conversations and questions and, and testers and poses and, and entrapment, trying to make Jesus look stupid, trying to make Jesus seem like he does not understand God, the scribe comes in. That's where today's passage picks up, is that a scribe walks into the conversation now, in Jesus' time, scribes held power. The scribes were the people who made um, handwritten copies of the scriptures. And if I understand it, also the midrash. So it's kind of like a big job to be a scribe. Your job is to make copies upon copies so they can be passed around to other religious leaders. Sometimes um, scribes were also priests and they got to conduct and lead the religious rituals and, and, and ceremonies. They were educated. They held honour. They knew the law because they kept right, They were the ones who wrote it all out. They memorised it. They knew it really well. They knew the law. They were scholars of it. They also sometimes helped in the interpreting of it because they also got to read the midrash. I don't know if you know, the midrash was all these notes that would happen down the sides of the scrolls where people are given understandings of what this might mean and how you might need to interpret this, a particular law. So they were like religious lawyers, the scribes. They did a lot of hard work. It was, your honour was bestowed on you for be, being a scribe. And he comes with a question. Now, it may, have been a, it may have been a genuine question. I don't know if you've ever found yourself in a position where you're watching other people squabble. And it seems like the conversation really isn't isn't really resolving. And have you ever been there where someone comes with a question or maybe you've been the person who's, who's able to sit and watch and then ask the humdinger, the bell ringer of the question that hits the point, hits the heart of the issue. And the scribe's question relates to the law. He says, what's, what's the greatest law? Now, we need to keep in mind that in Jewish law, there's 613 laws, right? It's not, like there's, it's not just the Ten Commandments. It's not just a few other little bits and pieces added on. There's 613 laws. And the job of any scribe, the job of any priest, the job of the, the, anyone in religious, a, a teacher, a rabbi, you knew what those 613 laws were. But try and prioritise them is a question of entrapment. So Jesus answers the question. And he digs deep into Jewish law. And we've had both the, um, the, the, the reading from Deuteronomy this morning, which is where Jesus quoted from, that part of the law. And we've also had the reading from Mark. And the answer comes that the greatest law, the greatest commandment, is to love the Lord your God 
with all your heart, soul and strength and to love your neighbour as you love yourself. It's the most profound of truths. Just about every Christian will probably be able to recite that to you. The depth of it is, is that God is found not at the end of a ritual, not at the end of a ceremony or in the middle, like it's not that God isn't found in those things, but if you really want to know, if you're really looking for God, if you're really seeking something bigger in your life, The profound truth is, is that life is found when we choose to love. Love for God, love for others. And in the middle of that, we'll find love for ourselves. And if you walk out of here with nothing else than that this morning, feel free to go to sleep for the rest of what I'm about to say. The scribe says, you're right. There's agreement between both Jesus and the scribe. There is no greater law than that. There is no greater truth. They hit common ground. There's this point of connection in front of everybody else. They both hold their honour. Isn't that something we need to learn more of? How do you hold honour in a contested space? But the reading this week leaves, has left me, landed a question on my lap, and I don't know if it lands the same question on your lap than my, as, as it does on mine. But why does Jesus respond with the words after the scribe has given the correct, after Jesus has given the correct answer and the scribe has agreed with him? Jesus' answer is this. You are not far from the kingdom of God. Have you ever wondered about that? Have you ever wondered? Like they're both agreeing that it's the correct answer. And Jesus' answer to him is, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Why do you think that might be? Prove it. Put it into practice. Right. Exactly right. So Brad's answer is, is, is that, and where I'm, what I want you to hear in my understanding of things is that, is that the, um, Jesus' response about you are near the kingdom of God comes because the scribe is part of a system that is not about love. The scribe is part of a system that is a long way away from the kingdom of God. And in refocusing and recentering himself to the answer of love, he's come close. I take it to mean this. So I'll come to Brad's, I'll give you the rest of Brad's answer in a moment because if you didn't hear it, what Brad said was, was that you need to prove this. You need to live it out. And I do believe that's what Jesus is saying to the scribe. That God is not a concept. God's not a theory. God's not an essay answer. God's not an HSC exam paper. God is not this other entity that you just kind of, you, you capture in words 
as a right answer. God is not a cognitive test about whether you're in or you're out, whether the gates of the door, the gates of heaven open up for you or close. Now, I know that goes against the theology that I grew up with, that the kingdom of God is kind of like this barricaded place. And if I don't get my beliefs in order, then, then it's, it's closed to me. I rather suspect what's going on here in this passage is that Jesus is saying it's one thing to know it, but you actually have to live it. And that's when the kingdom of God opens up to you. When you open yourself up, when you take the risk of handing over all of your life to love, that's when you're handing it over to God. And that's when the kingdom of God kind of starts to embrace you. We're helped a little bit in the Greek in this place, at this point. Because the Greek t- the, in the Greek, and we lose this when it comes across to English translation, it's very clear that, that this, this is an all, like we, we do get this all of your heart, mind and strength, right? In the Greek, it's, it's much stronger. It's all of who you are needs to be handed over to love. But further than that, love in this passage, as I keep trying to tell you about a whole range of other things in the Greek, it's not a concept, it's not an idea, it's actually a present tense continuous verb. You live it out. Every next step you take, we're called to make that a step of love. Every decision you make, every direction you go, every interaction you have, every word we say, we have the invitation to make it one of love. That's why I say love's a pretty tough thing. We all know we have to love, we all know we should love, we all know we're called to love, but so many times, this is where the falling short comes in. So many times we take a lesser option. And so today, all I want to say is that I'm not going to give you a description of love. I'm not going to give you a definition of love. I'm not going to give you an answer to the knowledge question of what love is. I'm going to make this invitation to you that I think Jesus is making to the scribe. Do you want to go further? Do you really want to go further? Rather than just being near, it's one of those things, you know, like like some parts of my life, near enough is good enough. But the kingdom of God invites us into this much richer and deeper space where love becomes who we are. And that's what I'm inviting you to do. Not just today, not just at morning tea, not just, you know, like, like, but when we walk out into the world to marinate ourselves in this flavour of love, the flavour of God, if you like. And let every interaction be one of love. So when we're tempted to gossip, choose encouragement. When we're tempted to hold on to stuff that we believe is ours, choose generosity. When, we choose, when, when we're tempted to be resentful,
or to seek revenge. Choose forgiveness. When we're tempted to say that's somebody else's problem, choose compassion or mercy. I could go on. And, and only you know the circumstances you'll be in this week and next week and the week after and next month and for the rest of your dying, your, your days, breathing days. Only you know the circumstances that you are in. Only you know the people who are the ones who test you or the circumstances that test you. But what I do know is this, is that the invitation is there for all of us that life is found. It's actually our vision statement as a church, finding life through finding God. We will find life when we choose to love in the way that God loves. And that's my invitation to you this morning. Believing is great. Living it is a whole lot greater. Let's pray. Loving God, lead us in love. Lead us to love. And Lord, we pray that we might be willing to be your people of love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing, We Will Love.
Good morning. On behalf of our church council, welcome to worship, both here in the room and further afield online. Uh, let me quickly just say uh, thank you to the youth worship team last week for the uh, week off. Um, it's good to have uh, others step up to do this job and uh, I'll give you advance notice. Uh, Sunday the 1st of December I'll still be in Sydney after school spec so there's another opportunity for somebody to talk to Graham about stepping up into this little spot. Uh, our news sheet is still on uh, hiatus at the moment. I think it'll be back into publication next week. So uh, there's a couple of top things to mention. First of all, our congregational meeting is on the 17th of November, coming up really, really quick. Uh, around 11 o'clock after our worship service right here. So that's an important message for the members of our congregation to take part in the organisational and spiritual life of our church moving forward. Uh, our nominations period is coming to a close. We really need to know the names of anyone else who would like to stand for positions of eldership and church council, uh, preferably by today, if we can let uh, Graham know, um, so that the paperwork can be made ready for our congregational meeting. Uh, Graham has also asked if anyone is wanting to join the Thursday evening online Bible study that he is preparing um, to please let him know because without news and notes we can't print out a Zoom address so um, he needs to know who we are so that he can get us the uh, log on details to join in with that activity. Um, that's pretty much it for news and notes for the moment until we get our published copy available next week. I will always remind um, our friends online if you want to get your own published copy of news and notes in your inbox, um, you can see on the screen cruc at nnn, uh, dot nnn sorry, at gmail.com and we can add you to our list. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it for news and notes. I'm being very careful with Graham's notes here that I don't lose his paperwork. Um, it's one of those weeks where I get to now switch hats and become the prayer person as well. So um, as we come ready to uh, come before God in prayer, um, I open my prayer with reference to the, to the group of readings that were set down for today. Of course, we shared two of them. Um, amongst them, Graham's right, 1 Corinthians 13 didn't make the cut. Uh, but we did have Ruth, where Ruth was loyal to Naomi in spite of cultural expectations that she wouldn't be. Uh, Psalm 146, which is worth a look, and Hebrews 9, which was also worth a look. So if you want to follow that up, check those ones out as well. So let's come before God in prayer. Lord God, in our reading set for today, we are called to invest our trust in you, to reaffirm our allegiance to your ultimate commandments of loving you wholeheartedly and loving our neighbours as we should love ourselves. Connect us anew in the fruit of your spirit, we pray, to act with peace and love and compassion in this community and for our world. Father, in our gatherings of this week, both casual and arranged, guide our actions and our speech in your love and care to focus on the good when so much attention in our media is drawn from anger, malice and anguish instead of solutions. We pray for our parliaments, state, territory and federal. Help us to impress upon our representatives the standards we need to deliver the greater good to the greater need. We are blessed and we ask for your grace to pay it forward within this nation, beginning right here. Lord, we pray for the significant events occurring in our world, for the regions at conflict and especially in open warfare, for the people denied food and shelter and safety because their leaders are totally focused on power and control, for the people of the USA deciding their presidential and congressional representatives within a deeply troubled national environment, descending into hatred and bigotry. 
for the communities suffering from severe weather events in nations without the resources to feed and house their many in need. For the opportunities and our nation's willingness to be the solution in the provision of aid and support. We now bring before you in our silent prayers those known to us who are struggling, be it illness, grief, or the deep sadness at the events in our world. Hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus, our Saviour and Redeemer. Amen. Sing. I just wanted to share, like Brad um, mentioned in our prayers, um, uh, pray for those who are grieving. And I just want to, I, I'm going to talk about people you don't know. Um, but, uh, but just a part, a large chunk of the Uniting Church is actually in grieving this weekend. Um, Michelle Cook, who was the moderator elect and it was one of the presidential candidates at the last elections in our assembly, was um, killed by a, like, hit by a cyclist on Wednesday afternoon and died. Um, just on Thursday. So um, Michelle, um, I, I don't even really know Michelle, but I know that, that through the Uniting Church there's a number of people for whom she was a, a wonderful, she was a reverend deacon, so she's a deacon like myself. Uh, and um, I'm, just, I'm just sharing it with you. If you're a praying person, you might want to pray for the church. I know she had, they had a lot of impact. She and she was married to James Hughes, is a name you, some of you might know. Uh, and they've got two children. Um, but they're in, like the, the church in the Northern Territory, the church in, in um, Tasmania, where they were um, placed for quite a number of years, uh, in, in deep grief. So just hold them in your prayers and their family. Thank you. Um, we're going to sing, to finish up with, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Let's stand together if you're able and sing. Alphatry Prayer. God of love, in love and through love we bring these gifts of our time, our money, our lives, our all. To you and to your will and your purposes, your kingdom. And Lord, we bring these gifts to be shared in our world in our community, in our church and those around. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friends, go forth in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Honour all people. Strengthen the faint-hearted. 
help the afflicted, support the weak, and in so doing, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.